And now, coming to you live from the City of Angels, Los Angeles, California, it's the Sheena Metal Experience with your host, Sheena Metal, only on KGRA Digital Broadcasting. Welcome to the Sheena Metal Experience on KGRA Digital Broadcasting Network. I'm your host, Sheena Metal. I'm a psychic medium. I'm an interfaith minister. I'm an energetic healer. I'm a 29-year talk radio host in Los Angeles and beyond. I'm a creative and a performing artist. I'm a paranormal survivor. And I come to you live from my home in Southern California every Friday at 3 o'clock Pacific time. This show is about spirituality. It's about creativity. It's about humanity, it's about passion, it's about service, it's about becoming and then being your best possible you in this big, beautiful world, and then inspiring others to do the same. And every day on the show, it may be my show, but it's always without a doubt and forever your experience. My guest today is a very old friend and a very wonderful guy doing wonderful things for the world. Um, He is the owner of Parapod TV, where my messages from Spirit Show airs every Wednesday at two o'clock Pacific time. He's also the owner of the UBN Go radio station. He's the founder of the Parapod Festival, of which I had the honor of speaking this uh, earlier this year and hopefully again next year. And um, he is the host of an amazing show called Truth Be Told. And it's an honor to have him here. Uh, please welcome the wonderful Tony Sweet. How are you, my friend? Oh, sorry. <laughs> got me. Did you fall asleep during your bio? Because I did. <laughs> I and was like, that even, guy's so boring. <laughs> that doesn't even scratch the surface, right? I mean, you actually have two radio stations, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I do have uh, one network with different topics. Yes. Entertainment okay. and then also one for LGBT and then also for para- paranormal. So, I mean, I guess you could say three. That's wonderful. And Parapod TV is one of those. Correct. Yes. Okay. That's the paranormal hub, right? Where we, yeah, right. where all of us, all of us weirdos gather. And That's you right. yourself are a uh, a ufology enthusiast. So, yeah. your truth be told is not all about ufology, but you cover no. a lot of that on the show. Yeah, I I uh, I'm a person of ADD, so choosing just one topic always bored me. So whatever interests me. And uh, I try to stay topical when it comes to the seasons, like now of Halloween. But uh, yeah, it's really whatever interests me for that month. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So, so I know because we've been friends for a really long time that that you grew up in the middle of the country. I did. Um, when you and you grew up in a in a, a Christian household, right? Well, a Christian uh, community. My my household wasn't necessarily lived by the law of the Bible. So, okay. um, but I mean, I grew up around the the Bible Belt for sure. So, when you were growing up, what was sort of the experience of talking mm-hmm. about ghosts, talking about UFOs? I mean, were these things you were able to voice as a child, and did you believe in all of that then? I think. My my father was never a believer of much, um, but my mother definitely was someone that we had a lot of conversations with about, you know, the spirit world and, and the Bible. And I mean, she knew the Bible, but she didn't really live uh, to go to church every Sunday. Um, and also with UFOs, like because we experienced both ghost and a UFO together, my mom, my brother, and my sisters and myself all experienced it. So yeah, it wasn't something that was like, you just, she just had to believe me of what we experienced. Right. Did you grow up in a house that was active? Yes. So the house I grew up in, um, in fact, my great aunt owned. um, And then before that, apparently it was built by the banker, the local banker back in the early 1900s. Um, when I was a kid, I used to see a ghost. Uh, my family used to hear the doors and the walking and things happening. And, and so of course, as you get older, many of us, you know, lose that ability 
<laughs> sure, sure. But but uh, yeah, so it was an active house. In fact, my nephew, years years later, uh, when he was about the same age I was, he actually saw the old man too, and it scared his um, mother, my sister in law. So yeah. I mean, it's interesting because when we're little, right, it's so easy for us to see things because we're more about home than we are here. Right. And the more time we spend here and the more people tell us that doesn't exist, the more we lose our gifts that we kind of have to find our gifts again right. as we get older. Um, but but then there's the things that you don't have to have gifts to see, right? Like mm -hmm. the water turning on and the door slamming and, right. <laughs> you know, the, 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 you know, I live, my house that I live in now is on an Indian burial ground. I'm, I'm back in my childhood home that I grew up in in Southern California. Right. After I left the horrible haunted house in Baltimore, we moved to the Indian burial ground because apparently, you know, right. um, fire, you frying, pan, frying pan fire with my parents. <laughs> um, but every once in a while, I'll go out and I'll come home and the gas will be on. And I know oh I didn't leave the stove on because I, I've been in the kitchen and I know I turned the stove off and I come home. It's like 12 o'clock at night and there's the stove on. Or... Um, or I come home and the water's running or, oh uh, you know, and it's just stuff that happens, right? There's activity. Right. <laughs> I do everything I can. I have salt lamps and selenite wands and selenite towers and brooms <laughs> and I burn incense and can still a little, a little bit of it gets through. And, and they're like this, keep going, keep going. <laughs> exactly. I have a cat. I mean, I do everything I can to keep it away, but every once in a while a door slams or something falls over for no reason and then I have to remember that that's um, that's living in an active house. And it's been an effort because um, having grown up in that hideous house, I didn't ever want to live in an active house again. How do you feel about that? Have you lived in haunted houses since then? And would you do it again? Like, would you buy a place if you knew it was haunted? I, you know, I, I think I would. I Even though I haven't stayed in a house, I mean, I haven't lived in a house that I felt was active, but uh, uh, clients of mine years ago, when I was a personal trainer, before I was in the podcasting and all that stuff, I used to kind of watch clients' homes um, as they would go on their, you know, month, two month vacations of, sure. you know, so they, they had this home in Beverly Hills adjacent. And it was like an early, like 1920 home that was built and lived in by some opera singer. I never ne necessarily saw anything, but you know where you just get the chills and the hair on the end of your, you know, the, the hair stand up on end. And so that was where I, I stayed in a home going, there possibly is some activity here yeah. for sure. And they, when they were getting their house done, uh, redone, it took them like two years to redo this whole house. You'll never guess the house that they rented for a year. Oh, no. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Drum roll. Blah, 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 blah. They actually rented because their friends owned it was Marilyn Monroe's house. Oh, wow. Okay. So I got to go visit and walk through it and talk about the hair standing on end. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah it seems like everywhere that Marilyn Monroe was, she oh. left like an energetic footprint wherever she was. Oh. Right? She's a yeah. haunter. She's she's haunting the world. She's got things to say. And um, yeah. I mean, even the Hollywood Roosevelt, right? Like pretty much everywhere yeah. that I think everywhere. she was, she's left an imprint. Yeah, and the Hollywood Hills, I think because they sit on so much limestone, right? Yeah. Everything yeah. up there is so haunted. I have friends that are in bands that have recording studios in their homes and they pick EVPs up on the recordings oh, when they're wow. recording bands and yeah, some of them are cool. scary um my friends picked up this one they were recording and they just he went back to mix and he was checking out the vocal track and on the end there was this woman saying like he won't let me go and they kept <laughs> it on they kept it on the cd and oh, it's kind of scary after the song ends to hear this scary voice say that um but the, i i remember cool. before i admitted i had gifts probably even to myself before i came out to myself uh, going places in the Hollywood Hills and and having a very hard time in those homes and not really knowing why I was having such a hard time, but it it being because um, it, they're so haunted up there. I I, I would not want to live up there. In fact, I have clients 
and they're always calling me and I'm forever doing house cleanses. And then they'll, they'll go, we can't live here anymore. It's too haunted. They'll move to another one. And it's just as haunted. They move to another one. And I'm like, you guys have got to stop living in the hills. Obviously, there's something about you all that you resonate very high. <laughs> right. Spirits love you. And so stop going to haunted houses in the hills and get some nice thing like in West Hollywood in the flat area or Beverly Hills or something. Right. <laughs> stay out of the hills because they're haunted. Um, I don't I don't I, I'm laughing. I was just going to say I don't want to live in another haunted house and then laughing because Indian burial ground. But right. I can tell right. you if this place became as active as the place I grew up in in Baltimore, I, I would not live here because I just don't want to be like running out of my house at three in the morning, screaming half naked every night. I just have no, I know there's some people that think that's their idea of fun, but I, right. I have nowhere to do that. I, I was going to say, I think, you know, if you watch like, uh, you know, Amityville, of course, you know, that the movies enhance everything, but still, sure, sure. if you lived in an activity like that, where you don't get a lot of rest or even yeah. burn, I think that would definitely get to the point where it would be too much. But do you think that living in an active house could benefit you in any way? Is there a, is there a, cause you know, it's like we, 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 we hear or talking about how it can be annoying or scary, but is there a, ever a time do you think it could actually enhance your abilities or in, enhance your life? Well, you know, that house in Baltimore was like an Amityville or a conjuring house. So Dude, we didn't scary. sleep. And everybody was sick all the time. We were all at each other's throats. Oh, it wow. It was misery every day. Um, Even the animals would, you know, go to a certain room and come out and try to kill each other. Oh, geez. but So I thought I would, I would have said no. But I have to tell you, moving into this house with all the native energy underneath, and I'm not kidding about the Indian burial ground, like there's proof. Um, <laughs> it, it, I, I, when I first moved in here, I was like, I'll never do readings in this house. I'll never talk about anything paranormal. I'll never watch a scary movie. But now, you know, you're right. I think living with this energy and living in tandem with it, with having full respect for it and where I am and where I'm living and being thankful for the energy that's coming up out of the ground, I actually think it does help my gifts. And now I do all that stuff. I read for people here. I have a cabinet full of haunted <laughs> dolls over here. I swore I'd never own a haunted doll, but now I do. Oh, that's um, fun. I think it's made me even more mystical than I was. Um, and I feel safe doing it. And I'm having a nice relationship where I'm really learning to, to trust the house and the house is learning to trust me. You know, an active house, Tony, right? It's like a living thing. Right. And you have to make a good relationship with it. Yeah. And how, how did you find out it was, it was the Indian burial ground and are, and are there still remains under there? So I live on a wildlife preserve that uh, separates where I live from Pacific Coast Highway. Right. And in between there's these wetlands. So of course, since we bought this house 43 years ago, there has been the constant struggle of the developers wanting to get rid of the wetland. Of course. Because they want to build there, right? Prime real estate on PCH. Um, but there are like two or three species of heron that are endangered mm -hmm. and they only live there. And that had kept it happening. And then there was this whole thing about 20 years ago where we were going to, why don't we just relocate the heron and then we can build there because a lot of people would like to build like a four seasons and they think it's an yeah. ice or there's this right. wetland. Well, somebody was fishing and lo and behold, pulled up a 10,000 year old burial bowl. Wow. Oh. And so now there's the proof that it was, in fact, now they found more artifacts. So now they know that the tribe that lived here, this was their burial area. And the hill that's not very far from me, suddenly there's a steep hill that goes up. That was their shamanic grounds. And this was their burial grounds. Was and it Chumash? Funny, what? Was it Chumash? No, I Did don't they... know who it was. No, the Chumash are up by Santa Barbara, right? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know no, if it, it was something um, else here. Um, oh, wow. And uh, they kind of canoed back and forth between Catalina and here. Uh -huh. And this was definitely where their burial ground was. So uh -huh. it's funny because my best friend has, amongst other things, she and her son run the, the Huntington Beach Historical Society. And they have a Santa Claus business at Christmas. And um, she always tells me like certain houses that are around mine. She's always like, oh, those house don't. And I was like, I want to move here maybe when I wasn't going to live here. She's like, nope, super haunted, super haunted. 
And <laughs> even her house, honestly, is super haunted. This I didn't realize until I moved back here, because when I lived here as a young person, it was so very fundamentalist here that you never talked about this stuff, you know? My mom kind of hid her dragons in secret. But <laughs> um, but now I, I guess they call it Hauntington Beach in the community. Haunting, I love that. That's a, So I love that's it. A and so I founded the Surf City Paranormal Society, and I'm all about now finding all the haunted stuff and going out and helping all the people that don't know how to get help, like, you know, like oh, we wow. didn't know in the 70s. So right, now right. I'm embracing this haunted town. I'm, I'm curious, and I hear I'm interviewing you, but I, I'm okay. actually really fascinated because I'm curious that a lot of the hauntings of, it sounds like of old, older, 100, 200, maybe even 300, 400 years of uh, the, the white people of America. Right. Um, a lot of times, you know, I'm sure many of them, like the one I grew up in was very gentle, was more just, sure. you know, you know, probably is like, I really love my house and I didn't really want to go. Uh, but I'm wondering if the the negativity that you had, it was it in Boston? Where? No, it was outside of Baltimore. Baltimore. Was, was it? Baltimore and the Pennsylvania border, like right in the middle. Was Was it, was it on some type of a burial ground also or? What was the portal for that? Um, Is it, was it was it just leftover spirit or was it something deeper than that? Might just have been a portal, but also um, uh, uh, a lot of um, Civil War stuff because oh, yeah, yeah. Maryland was technically north of the Mason-Dixon line, but it was right. very Southern sympathizing. So right. the, the how I lived on a like a court, like there was nothing. And then mm -hmm. suddenly there was my street and it was a court with 13 houses and then nothing. Oh and the God. lady whose house was the closest to the main road, it was it was a 1700s house. And she used to brag that they they hid Civil War soldiers and her and Confederate soldiers in her attic in the day. So and one <laughs> time my mom, who, you know, was also a psychic. Right. She was looking out the laundry room window, which overlooked the front yard, changing the laundry at like three o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden she saw this gigantic civil war encampment on the front oh lawn my gosh. and she looked down and she was in this black civil war morning dress. So yeah, there was definitely that stuff there, but there was more than that. There was a, almost like a pet cemetery kind of nasty energy in that area. And we were right. There was woods all around us. And, um, there was a river that ran right on the bottom of our property. So it was like all the conduits, right, for for paranormal adventures. Oh and um, like I said, there was weird wildlife that would show up, like snakes would show up on the patio Ugh. for no reason and knock their heads on the sliding glass door and drive the dogs crazy. Oof. And And at midnight every night, one of our dogs, who was so docile, um, at one point, out of the blue, it never had happened before. These two dogs, they were best friends. They grew up together. At one point, this dog, every night at midnight, would go in the guest room. And then he would come out and try to kill the other dog. Oh, my God. Literally try to kill him. So my mom started keeping that door closed. because the, And then the dog would sit outside that door and scratch and try to get in, like, obsessed. Wow. So there was a lot of really weird stuff. And we had a, one of those full full furnished basements downstairs right. and had like a bathroom and a bar and <laughs> a wine cellar and all these things we never used. And I would have slumber parties down there with my junior high and elementary school friends and things would come in. There was a separate entrance where you could go up outside from the outside right. and the people, things would knock on the door and it was all on this, all kinds of things. So yeah, we, it was a good place to freak yourself out, but no, yep. it, was, it doesn't feel good to live in a house like that because Right. You don't get the rest you need. You don't get the grounding that you need. It's it's one thing to go to a paranormal place and get the crap scared out of you and then come home and, and live in your grounded environment, right? right. But to go <laughs> where your environment is the the celestial poop yeah. show, that's not it's not fun. No. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um I remember when I was a kid, uh I used to like I would sneak into my parents' house or uh, parents' bedroom bedroom and I would sleep on the floor because I would I would see this old man and I would yes. and I and then they're like, What are you doing? Go back to bed. And I'm like, No, I, I don't want to because I keep seeing and mom's like, You're fine, go back to bed. Um, but uh, like I said, he was such a gentle 
a gentle uh, spirit that uh, nice. now it probably wouldn't bug me. And, you know, you would, cause I, the only thing I ever did see one time uh, that I saw any type of aggression, right. I don't even know if it was aggression. It was probably for me, it was an aggression, but it was probably just, Hey, I'm here. I remember being home alone and I kept hearing the walking or a door shut or, sure. and, I, and I'm just like, Oh my God, I just, and I was a little older. So I was probably 14, 15. And I remember walking and, you know, back in the days, stairs were really steep. They were yes. Like, nowadays they're pretty, you know, wide and comfortable. Um, now this one is pretty wide. So, and we had railing at the top so you could see over and we had a painting at the top of the stairs and it was an old painting too. And, um, and I started walking up and I just was trying to peek around the railing to see if I can see anything. And then all of a sudden the painting, instead of, you know, if it falls off of a, a nail, it usually slides down. Right. This one came out like it came towards me and fell in front of me. And I sprinted down the stairs, out the front door, down to my dad's grocery store. And they're like, why? And he, oh, dad, oh, oh, this painting and did it. You know, they're like, okay, whatever, whatever, whatever. But that was the only time that I ever had something that I saw physically move or yeah. something that I felt like at the time was aggression. Now it's probably just like, I'm here. Right. You know, so you know. Right. <laughs> right. But you know, the thing about being a paranormal survivor is, is that once you've been scared to death by it, you don't want it around you. Like I don't, yeah. sometimes I'll be holding the cat and all of a right. sudden he'll whip his head around and he'll be looking at something. Right. And I just say, I just say, Cullen, baby, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Whatever <laughs> it is, don't, don't tell mommy. I don't want to know. Yeah. But I know what he's, you know, what he's, and, and we are now, I'm in the middle of getting ready to do a big remodel. And um, I'm, I'm nervous because you hear all the stories, right? About they really come out after the remodel. Right. Um, I got to get rid of these uh, 50 year old orange shag carpets. So oh, I got to do something, you know, but, oh, no, um, for sure. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm concerned because they say that's when that, they really come out and I don't, and I don't want them to. Interestingly enough, the area where, where the spirits in this house, I believe really congregated when I lived here before as a young person, um, was over the garage. I have like a slanting roof, but I'm going to knock that out and build a couple extra bedrooms. Oh, nice. So hope I will that get rid of them or is it going to make it worse? Cause I, it's like, you well, they're just going to invite their, it. yeah, they're just going to invite their family over. Exactly. <laughs> a Look, couple more, more bring, bring more guests, more ghosts. Right. <laughs> yeah. So what did you, um, when did you see your first UFO? Uh, so again, uh, I'm from a very small town called Granola. And I, I think I've told you before, it's about, well, at the time, probably about 300 people. It's maybe about wow. 125 now. Um, it's 125 people now? Now. Yeah. It's, it's because oh it, most, most kids that, you know, that there's no, there's no jobs there. There's not enough to really keep you to living. So, most people my age at the time or even now they move away to where the jobs are and most the people there now are just old i mean my dad's 88 and you know a lot of pretty much all his cousins and siblings and everybody they're gone um so yeah it just keeps getting older and older and the town gets smaller and smaller um but uh, even my dad's the house my dad lives in is was he moved out of the house that I grew up in and moved in where my grandma and grandpa. Well, I just called the other day about, you know, doing some uh, about the taxes and they're like, Oh, that was built in 1880. And I'm like, what? I was like, wow. I thought, it was, I thought it was built like maybe 1920s, but no, it was built in like 1880 something. And so I thought, wow, talk of, and, and I do feel well, I feel like there's some some spirits there, of course. Pro could be my grandma and grandpa, but there's probably stuff from, from before. Right. Uh, but so where I grew up, you know, it's in the Flint Hills. You know, it's it's pretty. It's in the valley, in a valley. So, um, you know, there's a lot of hills and trees and little woods and stuff like that. And so 
back in the seventies when I was in my single digits. Um, <laughs> yes. The glorious seventies of our single digits. Right. Um, there were there were a lot of UFO sightings in in that area, but we're we're about seventy miles away from Wichita, and they had McConnell Air Force Base. So a lot of people thought, oh, it's, you know, probably just the Air Force doing these special missions. And they did. They used to come down and fly over and and pretend Granola was a, a target range. And so, in fact, people, the, the city had to call the call the base and say, listen, you're breaking windows <laughs> because of your b- booms. That, so there could have been a lot of that um, in that area. But the one time that my mom, my sisters, my brother and myself, we were out in the country. We were driving home. I don't remember where we're coming from. And we have a lot of self-made or not self-made. Yeah, self-made ponds. We call them ponds. And there was apparently, I don't really remember it because I was pretty young, but apparently there was a UFO or unidentified because we don't know what it was, hovering over a, a lake. Wow. It was probably about four miles outside of my hometown. And so we stopped, apparently. My sisters got really scared. My brother, whatever. Mom told me that I wanted to go with them. Probably I'd watch Star Wars or something and thought. (laughs) (laughs) Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. and I wanted to go with them. Um, my, My siblings are eight, seven, and six years older than I was. So they were in their teens. So they actually all remember it like it was yesterday. Um, and apparently a, a, a single engine plane was flying by. You could hear that, but you couldn't hear the, the ship or whatever it was hovering. This single engine must have saw it because it turned around and it started coming right back towards that object. Oh, wow. Okay. And so there's, it was probably like, what is that? And so, and this was dark. It was, it was a, a kind of at night. It was, I think mom said there was still enough sun. You could see something hover. Um, um, and so as it got closer, the single engine plane, the object shot straight up in the air and disappeared. And so <clears throat> that was all I remember us talking about, you know, this, this, uh, this ship, the UFO, UFO. Well, then about four months before my mom passed away five years ago, we used to talk about it over the years. And my mom said, Oh yeah, I remember it. And then she was like, well, there was another time. And I was like, another time she goes, yeah. She goes, I remember you and I were driving out in the country, of course, (laughs) somewhere and we're going somewhere. And she goes, I was going to go drop something off at so-and-so's house. And she says, I look out into the field and there was an open field, like a wheat field or something. And she saw this silver, shiny disc. She goes, I know what a tractor looks like. I know what, you know, farming equipment looks like. She said it was nothing it like that. It, it was just this circular silver disc. And she says, and I slowed down, but I kept going because I just, you know, I didn't really know what to think. And that when I came back 30 minutes later, it was gone. Wow. So she says, I, I, I'm assuming it was something like a UFO. Well, then after my mom died, I talked to my sister about it. And my sister and I had really talked about this in a long time. So she was probably, I would say, 16 at the time, 15, 16. And she said... Yeah, mom, I remember mom calling the Air Force Base the next day and reported the UFO. And she says the Air Force Base came down to Granola and they apparently they got all the... uh, electronic equipment and started like going all over the the field where over by this lake and and i guess did all this research and wow so i i would assume that if it was the air force base that was there in the first place they would they would have just said oh you're probably just 
saw something and don't worry about it. But they actually showed up. And then my sister said that night of the actual sighting, she said, I had a dream that the UFO or the aliens or whatever they were came to visit me and took me in the ship. And she goes, I thought I was dreaming until I woke up the next day and my socks were completely soaked. Well, actually I had my socks on and I took my socks off when I went to bed. I had my socks on they were completely soaked like I had been outside. And so I was like, oh my God, did you get abducted? And she goes, I don't know. But she goes, I just, that's what I remember. That's, she goes, I thought it was a dream. So that was my experience as it for a wow. year. Wow. Yeah. I mean, when I was very little, my mom saw someone. And um, so I grew up my whole life with that memory of this is something that happened to mom, but you know, it was always like, this happened to me, but don't ever tell your friends kind of right, thing. Right. I think she was scared she'd be committed, but she was, um, she was in the laundry room. We lived in a Cape Cod house. This was in Connecticut before we lived in Baltimore. And um, so the first floor was actually the basement. Right. And um, she was in the laundry room and she had me on the dryer and she turned around and there was a man and he was standing in the corner of the room and he had like really light blue eyes and light curly blonde hair. And he had on jeans cute. and a red check shirt and white tennis shoes. And she said, what are you doing in my basement? And he disappeared. <laughs> so she did what you did in the sixties, right? She, she went to her therapist and he gave her some rigmarole about deep sexual desires. Oh God. Then, oh, said the, then said the man represented him, the therapist. So that was the last time she went to that therapist. He, um, he's like this, licking his lips. like he, Exactly, <laughs> right? So she never talked to anybody about it. And five years later, my dad got transferred to Chicago. We were living outside of Chicago. And my mom was reading the Sunday paper. And there was a story in the paper about this lady that was having a party. And she walked into the kitchen and there was a man in the kitchen. Dressed exactly the same, same clothes, same look, same everything. And she kept asking people at the party, do you know this guy in the red shirt? Do you know him? Nobody knew him. And she said to her husband, you got you to go in there and get this guy to go. So the <laughs> husband goes in the kitchen and says, who are you here with? Because nobody knows you. And the guy disappeared right in front of him. Oh and my. my mom always came to believe, <clears throat> she always believed that was a watcher. That was somebody that. <clears throat> the off-worlder sent just to kind of observe, right? To make him look human and put him in places to watch. So she always believed that. And that was always a story I grew up with. Then when we moved here, um, she started waking up with three red dots in a triangle behind her ear. Hmm. And she would always ask, like, what is this? Why is this happening it's to like me? Like an or something? Oh, I don't know. And then one day we were watching a show about UFOs and she saw the three red dots was a thing oh, when you had uh, been abducted. So she really became uh, convinced that she was an abductee. Um, <laughs> and so that was my, like, I didn't want, <laughs> I already sleep with the lights and the TV on from that house. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to be an abductee. So, um, so here's my weird story. So I always live with musicians that never slept. And one night, uh, my partner was out of town and I thought, you know, this is my night. I'm going to go to bed at 10 o'clock. I'm going to turn all the lights out and I'm going to go to sleep. So I go to sleep. It's 10 o'clock. I can hear the people in the pool and I can hear they're playing music at the pool. And I go to sleep. I'm so excited because I'm sleeping in the dark, which I never do when I'm alone. And I have not done since this night. I woke up and I could still hear the music. I could still hear the people at the pool. And there were these like little dudes walking all around the bed <laughs> and they had like little clipboards, but they were electronic, like iPads, oh, wow. now, this was, like 20 something years ago before right. doctors carried those. And they were probably, I don't know, maybe three feet high and they weren't paying any attention to me. And they were just wandering around the bed and I closed my eyes and I thought, whatever this is, this has to end. And I woke up. And I could still hear the music and I could still hear the people outside and they were gone. So wow. I thought, okay, well, I'm never sleeping with the lights off again and <laughs> never sleeping without the TV. <clears throat> so then maybe five, six, seven years later, I was on the phone with a friend of mine who was a psychic. And she said, tell me about, tell me about the time you saw the aliens. 
And I was like, what? She's like, the time you saw them in your room. (laughs) So I, uh, I told her the story and she said, they were there to help you because you had a thing and they fixed it and it was going to wind up being trouble. She's like, and by trouble, I mean trouble that starts with a C. And I'm like, um, she's like, look for the thing that's missing. And I'm like, nothing's, nothing's missing. So when I was a young person, I had a horrible time with my reproductive system and my right ovary was horrible. But then when I was 21, I wound up losing my left ovary. So the Hmm. right one was the only one I had. And it was the one that always was trouble. So however many years later, after I talked to her, I had a hysterectomy and the doctor came to me after the surgery and he said, well, you know, everything's fine. We got everything. We got the giant fibroid tumor, but there's just one thing. We, we couldn't find your right ovary. And he said, we <laughs> literally took two hours looking for it and oh we couldn't God. find it. So we had to close you up. We don't want to keep you out any longer, but you know, sometimes things disappear on their own and it has been known to happen, but um, we just want to let you know that we didn't actually remove it. And, and I thought, okay, that's so weird. And then about three weeks after I got out of the hospital, I, You're thought, like, Bing! I thought, did those little things come and take that ovary? Because that ovary was so much trouble. Like since I was in junior high, that thing was trouble. And <laughs> is it true? Did they come and take it out? I mean, do they sometimes do, you know, benevolent work, like pro bono <laughs> medical work? Because we always think of like. You're like, I could pro- use a little bit of face like (laughs) right they could have taken a hundred pounds with it Um, but we always think about you know the anal probes and the nasal probes and the pregnancy and all the awful things but maybe sometimes they come and they fix things i I don't know i just know i've never had anything like that happen since i never had anything like that happen before Uh, it was the last time i ever slept alone with the lights out and um you know, there's my weird story, right? I mean, who knows? And I, I agree. People, yeah, I know? agree. I agree. I think, uh, you know, everybody always, uh, I mean, we, I hear, I've heard, I'm sure you've seen, I've heard both sides. You hear the people that have had really bad experiences. And of then course. some people, some people say it was an enlightened experience. And so I'm wondering sometimes if the, and I'm not taking this away from any. If some people just take it more as a neg- negative experience, sure. For one, their personality. Two, you know, just you know, if they just felt it was a bad experience, I don't know. I, I'm I'm curious because I've had people walk away and said, "I've it awakened me. I'm psychic now. I've you know, I've, I've I'm healed. I'm you know, so many different things." So you wonder you you wonder what uh, the true experience is. Right. Yeah. Right. And maybe some are negative. And so, I mean, they were weird looking little things. They were not, they did not look like the stereotypical grays. Right. Although they were sort of a grayish color, but they had more of like stocky bodies and more of a round face and not, not a pleasant looking face. Oh, so no cover model. No, no. They were going to be on alien cosmo cover right the the u.s the off-worlder swimsuit edition they're not going to make um unlike the man my mom saw who was actually beautiful i was gonna say sounded like a pretty handsome one she got the beautiful one um but (laughs) he um yeah yeah it's everything who knows right we don't know for sure we just even with all this work that i do and as much of a believer as i've always been and i always say i'm a second generation believer because like you my mom believed so it made it so much easier for me to believe but still i'm not somebody who would say i know this happened and i know it's the truth because i understand there's you know there's more things in heaven and earth and more things going on in our minds than we understand i can only tell you the story and you make w- of it what you wish, you know? Oh, of course. Yeah. I, uh, I, I'm trying to think of any of my, you know, grandparents or great um, aunt and uncles. I don't know if that's ever a co- been a conversation. Um, the only one that I, my grandfather, not alien, but I, he did have a near death experience in the sixties. Sure. So, wow. Which, which was very rare for, you know, he was a minister 
well, not he he was a business owner, but he had done some ministry stuff locally. So yeah, you 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 wonder if sometimes some of this stuff is passed down through generations to generation. Even my niece, uh, apparently, um, my sister's. I can't remember if, my, if it's Catherine or Samantha. Samantha, my niece, is autistic, but Catherine is one of these extreme, well, both of them are really extremely smart. But she said when she was a little girl, uh, one, of, one or the other, I can't remember, but um, in how she lives in now, she said things just kept getting broken. And yeah. she would go to the, my, my niece and go, hey, mama, it's not me, it's so-and-so this she would name this girl uh she did it and she, my sister's like what little girl and she says oh the little girl that lives down there by the barn and she and i went and she goes what and then instead of scolding her and saying listen there's no such thing and but she, you know she grew up around hearing and hearing the stories of me and hearing the yeah. spirits yeah. so she says all right well you tell let's just say call her irene she said, well, you tell Irene, if she keeps breaking things and getting in trouble, she's no longer welcome here. She says, oh, mama, she just jumped out the window and, and ran that back to her house. She said from that day on, nothing got broken again. Wow. Wow. So, yeah. Isn't that, isn't that weird? And, and she just told me uh, like two weeks ago, it was Catherine because she did say, she mentioned it. She says, Catherine has she goes she asked me she woke up and said mama did did you get that da, da, da? and she said no she goes well i had a dream about you going through this i'm not going to say what it is but um and she says catherine has a tendency to dream about things and they come true mm. so i'm wondering if she has the psychic ability absolutely absolutely and, and she's the one that has autism no, she's the one okay. that doesn't have autistic, uh, but um, she, but she is extremely smart, like yeah. grade A, you know, barely misses one thing, but she's extremely, extremely smart. Um, so, yeah, but yeah, so she used to even see a, a little girl um, and I think even like other animals too, when she was a little girl. Wow. Yeah. Very gifted. Right. And it, and it seems like she's held her gifts. How old is she? She's older than uh, the, 17 now. Right. So she's way older than the age you normally let it go. Right. So maybe, maybe that's something she she's can probably going to stay with her. Yeah. Yeah. I honestly, I wish, even though Char Margolis said, she says that she goes, she goes, Tony, you're very psychic. I have to say, I don't sit there and, and necessarily see the future or anything, but definitely I, I, certain people i feel their energy and i know not to get involved with them um and also there are things that i intuitions of, of things that um if i feel something i'm like oh that person's going to do this and and will my husband will go no 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 and then all of a sudden like two weeks later um yeah that person just did that and i'm like I told you <laughs> i mean yeah. so but uh, but well, that's I definitely really a gift i mean i think that being able to see into people right is yeah. is an intuitive gift it's definitely a gift i've just never sat down and really try to hone it in um right. but my like i said my mind is like all the time of creating things so it's like i just never really knew, i didn't think i would have enough uh, attention span to, to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but don't you think also that the way that you have to navigate so many different personalities with the stations, oh, with your three different stations and the festival, that's a lot of cats to herd. Yeah. And um, I think that it, maybe you use your gifts and your gift of empathy and, and intuition to help navigate all these personalities. That's, that's for sure. No, that is for sure. Um, I, uh, and I, and I've been very lucky of people that I associate myself with, you know, I've, you know, we all have made bad choices, but, um, sure. <laughs> but, uh, definitely, um, as I've gotten older and, uh, and realized, I think of potential gifts of trusting my intuition way more than I did when I was younger. So, Thank yeah. you.
<laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I feel the same way. I, I think that, the, and I talk about this a lot with my clients and when I teach that as human beings, we're taught to like go out there and make it and get that thing and knock right. that door down and make it happen. And that's so contrary to what spirit wants for us. And what spirit wants is really just make yourself the best person you can, right. work on your stuff, get your stuff in a group, be ready for it, and then just accept things as spirit drops them down in front of you. So when I stopped trying to like make things happen and just started Eight. letting things happen, yes. my life got so much better. And more things happened. I think we just lost Tony for a minute. Are you back? Uh, we can't hear you. You have to go out and come back in. This happens sometimes with the software that we use. Um, sometimes I think he's also lives out in a place where it, it might be hard. Go out and come. What did we do before we could text people? Sometimes it just happens. Luckily, I don't have that problem here. But when I, um, before Emery started engineering my show and producing it, when my program director, um, the wonderful Bill, uh, did it, um, he's up in the Hudson River Valley where it's like UFO Central. And so we would always have blackouts. And we thought it was me because I live here hanging off the continent by the beach. Can you hear me now? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, there you are. I was saying it might be the area that you're in. I was <laughs> laughing that when when we first started doing the show, before Emery engineered and produced, when my program director, Bill, was producing and engineering, and um, I used to drop out all the time. And we thought it was me because I live here like on the Indian burial ground hanging off the end of the right. continent. <laughs> but now, but it never has happened since Bill stopped engineering. And I think it was actually yeah. him living in that Hudson River Valley, which we know is like a UFO playground. Right, right. Well, actually, somebody uh, tried to call me in it. Oh, through. that happens, too. Yeah. 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 See, and my mom grew up in the Hudson River Valley. So long before she got say, abducted here, the she I'll probably was getting abducted up there. And uh, <laughs> she had all kinds of stories of seeing craft. Um, they, she, they lived kind of in a remote place outside of Poughkeepsie. Oh, and wow. She, she saw craft all the time. And and one time the two dogs ran towards where it was. Right. They were litter mates and only one came back and it never was the same, that dog. And oh, she really oh. believed they took they took the um the one of the dogs. Oh no. So leave the dogs, damn it. I know. Do they leave, leave the dogs alone? I can make take you a list people. of people to take. <laughs> I was gonna say take the people. <laughs> exactly. I'll make you a list, but leave <laughs> right. the dogs. Yeah, it's weird and it's weird because my um my parents, my grandparents donated that church, that that property to a church who had it for like since nineteen sixty. Right. And maybe 10 years ago, a metaphysical church called Cosm, the Chapel of the Sacred Mirrors, right. bought the property. And I had them on my show a couple of years ago and told them the stories. And man, all the same kind of stuff is still happening there. I think the dogs are safe. But the same kind of things my mom saw in the 40s on that property, um, they're still seeing now um, 80 uh, years later. So it's, uh, it's, it's interesting how a property sometimes just is what it is, right? Mm -hmm. We can try to exercise it. Right. We can try to sage it. But things that are as old as the ground or things that are a, a lighthouse for spirits or a lighthouse for off-world activity, sometimes you can't do anything to change that. You know, I, what's funny is when where I grew up again in Kansas, there's uh, my grandpa and my dad. I don't know if too many people around there know about this. There's there there was a uh, a big uh, Native American tribes around there, um, and what's funny is uh, how a lot of the the white people feel that they were uh, un, unsophisticated. They were uh, you know just tense and like you know fifty people at a time, but uh, actually very close to where I grew up was a huge Native American city um, mm -hmm. in Ark City, Ark, Kansas City, which is like 45 miles from where I grew up. 
Um, and I, I want to go there because I do want to find out more about this tribe and also to find out if there's a lot of sightings. But apparently they discovered this not too many years ago, but they said at least 25,000 people lived in this air, like in a city. They even had, wow. like, they had their own uh, tribal councils. They had all kinds like government, all kinds of different things. Wow. And I think it's funny, the history that we were taught where it was completely, you know, like they're just, you know, a few here and there, <laughs> you know, in, in little tents, but I'm curious of uh, some of these tribes that uh, had this many people at one time, or even Indian burial, burial grounds of people go around and do see if there's a lot, lot of activity. Cause I know it's very sacred to, you know, the, the tribes itself. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. We are totally out of time, but no. you'll have to come and do this again. And I would love to come to yours sometime. Let me know. Of course. Of course. Um, I love where it. can people find all of your stuff online, sweetie? Uh, okay. So truth be told, you can go to truth be told paranormal or so I, I created a whole new brand for truth be told The the shows are still the club paranormal. Um, and it's all, we're like a club of paranormal shows. Nice. Uh, yes. And we all, uh, air on our YouTube channel. You can go to the club paranormal and also on Parapod TV and on right. Roku. And so you can find us there. Of course, you can just look, uh, Parapod, uh, com, Parapod, uh, TV.com. You can check it out there and uh, yeah, anywhere you can don't, if you just type Tony sweet, you're going to find some older guy in Maine that has a big long beard and hair. Uh, <laughs> so that's not me, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, awesome. you can find, yeah, just look up truth be told paranormal though. I will do that. And I'm happy to be part of the paranormal club as well. Yes. I'm honored and to be part of Parapod TV. Uh, the wonderful Tony sweet, everybody. Thank you, my friend. And thank you to KGRA. Digital Broadcasting Network for putting this show together for me every week. Uh, we're here every Friday at three o'clock Pacific time. I'm your host, Sheena Metal. I'm at SheenaMetalSpiritual.com. I'm everywhere on social media at Sheena Metal. And if you want to send me a text message and just say hi, 818-437-0886. And um, it's great to be here every week with wonderful guests. Uh, till I see you next time, seek peace, live in love lead with kindness, embrace unity, always work to raise your vibration and know that you are loved and you are loved and you're so loved by me. I'm Sheena Metal. This is the Sheena Metal Experience every Friday at three o'clock Pacific time on KJRA Digital Broadcasting Network. Have a fantastic week. I'll see you next time.